will call to order the hearing of June 27th, uh, 2024. For case number Z0054-24 and Z0055-24, the Huffman K9 facility. My name is Joe Turner. I'm the county's hearings officer. I'll start with some brief announcements and a summary of the process that will follow so everyone understands how you can participate in the hearing today. I start by saying I'm not a county employee. I am licensed as an attorney and trained as a planner. I serve under contract to the Board of Commissioners. I say that so you know you're getting a somewhat independent review of the application before me today. My role as a hearings officer is to conduct public hearings and make decisions about certain land use matters in Clackamas County. In making those decisions, I'm required to apply the county's existing laws. I'm not a policymaker. I don't have the authority to vary from or change the laws. If you think that the laws need to be changed, you can work with uh, Board of Commissioners and Planning Commission to do that. But state law requires that this application be judged based on the laws in effect when the application was filed. As a hearings officer, I'm to provide an unbiased decision maker. I believe I am unbiased with regard to the application before me today. I've not had any pre-hearing contact with any of the parties regarding the subject of the application, and I don't have any interest in the subject property or any of the surrounding properties. But anyone has the right to challenge my impartiality, to argue that I'm biased in one way or another, and you can do that when it's your opportunity to testify. Procedure will follow. I'll start by asking staff to summarize their staff report, copies of which are available on the county website. And the applicant will have an opportunity to present their proposal and respond to the staff report. And if anybody else wants to testify about the application in support, in opposition, or with questions or concerns, they may do so. Once everyone's had an, an initial opportunity to testify, I will give staff and the applicant alone the opportunity to respond to the testimony that was offered. If that response includes any new evidence, the applicant, well, excuse me, if the, the response includes new evidence, I will give everyone a chance to respond to the new evidence. Otherwise, I'll close the public portion of the hearing and announce what I'm gonna do. Generally, I will issue a written decision within about two weeks after the close of the record. I will send my decision to the county. The county will send it to parties of record. So anybody who testifies orally or in writing before the close of the record will be sure and receive a, a copy of my decision when it's issued. Uh, anyone with an interest in this application may offer relevant oral or written testimony, but your testimony should be relevant to the applicable approval criteria, which are set out in the staff report. Also, please don't repeat testimony offered by yourself or earlier witnesses. Repeating your testimony doesn't make your case any stronger. The only issue before me is whether the application does or does not comply with the approval criteria. It's not a popularity contest. Whether everybody loves it or everybody hates it is not an issue I get to consider. Uh, in order to preserve your right to appeal, you or someone expressly represents, excuse me, let me back up. My decisions, it's important that all parties make their best case to me. My decisions are final for purposes of the county but may be appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals or LUBA. However, LUBA generally will not allow new testimony and evidence on appeal. They'll decide any appeal based on the record before me. So if you feel it's important that myself or any future decision maker know something about this application, you need to make sure it gets into the record before me. In order to raise an issue on appeal, someone must raise that issue. I think I just said that. <laughs> Uh, if the applicant wants to object to any conditions of approval based on constitutional grounds, they must raise those issues before me as well. Uh, if you feel you need more time to prepare, you can ask me to hold the record open or continue the hearing. If I hold the record open, you'll have the opportunity to submit additional written testimony and evidence before I make a decision. Um, if I continue the hearing, we'll, hold, we'll come back and do this again at, at a later date. But if anybody wants me to hold the record open or continue the hearing, you must make that request before the close of the hearing today. Um, and whether or not the hearing is continued or the record is held open for any other purpose, state law requires that I hold the record open for an additional week for the applicant alone to submit a final written argument without any new evidence. The applicant can waive that right if they choose. 
but if anybody else wants me to hold the record open um, or continue, you must make that request before the close of the hearing. Also, my decisions must comply with state law that requires that I issue a final written decision within 150 days after the application was filed. So there's some limit to how long I can continue the hearing or hold the record open. Uh, when you testify, please begin by giving your name and full stating your name and full mailing address. Please spell your last name so I get it right. And if you represent someone else, please say so. Um, but that concludes my introduction. Staff will give us a summary of how to um, how you could participate. Indicate that you'd like to participate through this Zoom platform. Great, thank you. Uh, this public hearing will be conducted virtually using the Zoom platform. Panelists for today's hearing, which include the hearings officer, county staff, and the applicant, have both audio and video capability. Audience members who have joined this meeting will have their microphones muted unless they wish to testify, in which case they will be called upon to do so by the county staff moderator. Audience members' video will not be turned on at any time. Today's hearing is being recorded as required by law. The county will make every effort to post the recording on the website later today. There is a designated time during the hearing when it will be open for testimony. The hearings officer will make it clear when this is. If you want to provide testimony, you will utilize the raise hand feature. For attendees on PC and iPad, you have a raise hand button on your Zoom bar, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your, depending on your device. When the moderator switches you over to provide testimony, your screen will look different for a little while. Primarily, you'll see all participants' cameras, not just the one who's speaking. Staff will call upon you when it is time for you to provide your testimony. Be sure to provide your name and mailing address when you begin. Once you've provided your testimony, your microphone will be muted and your screen will be returned to normal. If the record is left open at the end of this hearing and you wish to submit additional written testimony, you can email that written testimony to myself at mlord at clackamas.us or you can mail it to the Clackamas County Planning and Zoning Division at 150 Beaver Creek Road, Oregon City 97045. My email address is also available on the webpage where you found the Zoom link for today's hearing. Testimony must be received by 4 p.m. on the day that the record closes. People who wish to testify and provide, uh, people who testify and provide their mailing address will receive a copy of the hearings officer's written decision. If you do not wish to testify, but would like to receive a copy of that decision, you must provide your email or standard mailing address uh, to myself at mlord at clackamas.us or by entering it into the Zoom chat function during today's hearing. And with that, Joe, I can start. I created a PowerPoint for today if you'd like me to start with that. Okay. Um, so I will share my screen. And we're all looking at my PowerPoint here. <clears throat> Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, so again, my email address is the bottom uh, on the bottom of the screen here for those of you who need it or want it. Um, my name is Melissa Lord. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Planning and Zoning Division for Clackamas County as it relates to land use files Z0054-24 and Z0055-24 which are uh, applications for a conditional use permit and a non-conforming use uh, application. Generally, what I'll do is I'll summarize the proposal. Um, we'll talk very generally about the, the subject property, its location, and then I'll go through at a very high level the review criteria that, um, that we evaluate in order to make a recommendation for um, both of these application types. A complete uh, analysis um, of all of the relevant review criteria is provided in uh, my staff report, which has been entered into the ex uh, entered into the record as exhibit number one. For those of you who want a more detailed uh, description of of the findings that I've made, so generally speaking, this property is located about a quarter mile south um, on Pelican Court, south of the intersection of Mark Road and Pelican Court. Um, 
The property itself is zoned exclusive farm use or EFU. And all of the properties surrounding this one are also in that same EFU zoning district. <clears throat> this property is about five and a quarter acres in size. And Pelican Court um, as a subdivision is a rural residential subdivision and, and properties on this street vary from around two acres to 10 acres in size or thereabouts. The proposal that we're reviewing is to establish a commercial dog boarding kennel uh, within two buildings on site. Eight dogs would be located within an existing building and eight dogs would be uh, located within a new or a, a proposed building. The property owner would continue to operate dog training classes on the site um, as allowed by the EFU zoning district. And I'll talk a little bit more about that momentarily. Here's a snippet of the site plan that was submitted in the applicant's uh, application materials. I've highlighted two important areas on the site plan for us just to orient ourselves a little better. Um, in the northeast corner of the site, circled in blue, uh, I've got the location here highlighted of this proposed kennel building. Again, that would be for eight dogs. It's just around 650 square feet and tucked away um, sort of in this cluster of existing, existing structures on site already um, towards the back of the property or the east side of the property. In red, I've circled an existing structure. Uh, this existing structure is the topic primarily of our non-conforming use application, um, but the applicants also propose to uh, house about eight dogs in this particular building as well. So it is an, involved in this conditional use permit um, also. The structure uh, is existing, built prior to restrictive zoning. And so um, we'll talk more about that in a little bit as it relates to the non-conforming setbacks uh, of the zoning district. That hopefully can get ourselves oriented here. So there are two applications being considered today. The applicant requested that the hearings officer uh, review both of them concurrently. One for a conditional use permit as it relates to the commercial dog boarding kennel, and one for a conditional, um, one for a non-conforming use uh, permit, which relates to that existing structure. Um, the existing structure was surveyed on the property by the applicant and found to be about five feet from the property line, um, whereas the, the minimum setback for any new structure created today would have required an, a, a new building to be at least 10 feet from the property line. So in terms of non-conforming uses, we're really looking at the, the non-conforming situation in this case being uh, the setback, the setback of this building. In terms of what uses are or aren't allowed on the subject property, we turn to Zoning and Development Ordinance Section 401, um, which does list the specific uses allowed in the exclusive farm use zoning district. Um, in Table 401-1, in this particular section of our zoning code, you'll see that a commercial dog boarding kennel is uh, what's called a conditional use. So it's not allowed outright. It does require additional land use review prior to being uh, authorized on site. However, dog training uh, is allowed, provided that it complies with a particular subsection that I've got copied here uh, that limits the number of uh, classes and dogs per class and where you can operate training classes. Um, but I think it is important to note that there is a distinction between the dog kennel and the dog training. And um, the dog training classes, uh, the, the applicant did, did provide information then in their application materials that um, do state that they will comply with these limitations of number of classes and number of dogs held on site per day. Um, and so with that, provided that they are within these parameters, no land use review is necessary in order to operate dog training on the property. It is allowed outright the, the um, legislature did determine that this is a uh, compatible use in the EFU uh, exclusive farm use zoning district. So that's not subject to uh, our conditional use review uh, criteria. And it's not something that we've considered in this uh, land use application review process either. So really just looking at the kennel uh, use. Um, 
First, I'll talk about the non-conforming use criteria, and then I will move on to talk about the conditional use permit criteria, just to try and keep the two separate um, and hopefully flowing in a way that makes a little bit of sense, um, or that's easier to digest. So um, section 1206 of our zoning code speaks to non-conforming uses. Again, this is the consideration of using an existing building that has uh, what's called a non-conforming setback um, for the kennel. So under our current zoning district, uh, a minimum of a 10 foot setback would have been required to that Eastern property line, but the applicant survey showed that the building itself is about five feet from the property line. So again, that's the non-conforming situation we're looking at. There's three main components to this review, and I'll go through each one of the three and sort of how we landed on, um, how we've landed on a recommendation of approval for the non-conforming use application um, one by one. So first is the verification. We need to determine that the building itself was lawfully established and has continued to exist on site. So in order to do this, uh, we looked at aerial photos and the county's assessment and taxation records uh, to help make this determination. This is a snippet of an aerial photo that I've added as exhibit number 17 into the record. This particular aerial photograph was taken in August of 1976. I've added this red circle here to just highlight the particular property um, so we can see it a little bit clearer. As you can see in August of 76, there were buildings on site. I think that this is important because we we received, well, it's important for a couple of reasons, but first and foremost, we received a couple of public comments um, stating that this property was perhaps vacant until the mid 80s or at least sometime in the 80s. And this photo helps to, to prove otherwise that there were in fact buildings and development on the site already um, by August of 76. The second reason that this photograph is really important is that the initial zoning district um, for this property was established in September of 1976. And with that initial zoning district came uh, minimum required setbacks for any new structures built on this property. So any structure built after September 24, 1976 would have to have had a minimum of a 10 foot setback. With this photo, we can see that a number of these buildings were already existing prior to that initial restrictive zoning. And so they predate any requirement for a 10 foot setback. Coupled with this uh, aerial photo, staff looked at the assessment and taxation records. Um, this particular slide has two, uh, two pictures on it. On the right hand side of our slide, we've got the appraisal data and a small little map on the bottom corner um, that shows the location of existing structures and um, a correlating table up top with the size of the existing structures on site. Um, this assessment, uh, tax, tax assessment record was created in 1993. Um, on the left-hand side of our, our page, I've got a red box highlighting the year of construction for a number of these buildings on site. While the tax assessor seems to think that this particular structure um, that's the subject of this uh, dog kennel use was built in 1933. It also se seems to suggest that all of these structures existed on the property at least by 1973. Coupled with the photo that we have from 1976 showing that these buildings were already there, this provides some, some compelling evidence to suggest that at least prior to September of 76, the initial zoning date, uh, there were structures on this uh, on this property. Furthermore, I've got a series of aerial photos that show this specific building um, continuing to be on site. So this particular photo, I've got a red arrow here highlighting the, the particular building in question. This photo is from 1994. We have the same uh, aerial imagery uh, showing the same property in the same building in 2003, again, marked with this red arrow. And then in 2010, I've got the same photo here showing the building still there, and it is still there to this day. So when we look at the verification portion of this non-conforming use application, um, we did determine that the building was lawfully established and it has continued to exist on site ever since. 
So next we'll look at the alteration, the alteration of building size specifically. Then we'll talk about the alteration of building use, but the building size, uh, it looks like in sometime between 2005 and 2010, there was an addition that was made. And so our job is to ensure that there would be uh, no greater adverse impacts to altering the building size um, on this property. So here's two photos side by side, 2005, 2010. You can see on the northern side of this um, building, there was an addition that was made sometime between then. Uh, we don't have any permit records of it, of that building, um, because the building would have been considered a non-conforming use back then. Likely a permit, uh, a non-conforming use uh, application would have been necessary back then to expand this building. Um, we don't have evidence of that on file, and so we're, we're looking at this addition um, basically retroactively. But we need to determine that there's no greater adverse impacts to the expansion of this building. In, in fewer words, um, what we've seen from the submitted site plan and the applicant's um, property survey is that while the original building was 5.3 feet away from the property line, this addition was actually 12 and a half feet from the property line. As I've mentioned before, if a new freestanding building would have been built anytime from 2005 up until present, that new freestanding structure would have to have been at least 10 feet from the property line. When we consider that the addition being built here exceeds that minimum requirement, uh, it's 12 and a half feet from the property line, uh, we did find that, that uh, the addition did not have any greater adverse impact to the neighborhood. So um, that's the second thing we've looked at. Thirdly, and lastly, for the non-conforming use criteria, we do have to evaluate this change of use. The application in front of us is to use a portion of this building, um, a portion of this building that sits close to the property line for the dog kennel. So again, we'll have to evaluate that the kennel would not have a greater adverse impact to the neighborhood. Um, when we look at this particular criteria, I think it's important to look at it through the lens of the non-conforming location of the building. Um, we, do like, we do look at the kennel as a whole uh, when it comes to the conditional use permit, but in terms of the non-conforming use permit, we're really trying to evaluate whether the proximity of this building close to the, uh, closer to the property line than would be allowed today is going to have these greater adverse impacts on the neighborhood um, by changing that, that building to a new use. And so um, the change of use of about 750 square feet of this building to the dog kennel is actually going to occur in the portion of the building that already meets and uh, exceeds the minimum setback that would have been required today if this were a new, a new build. Um, when we look at that proximity to adjoining properties, Again, if it were a new freestanding free structure, the building that's being contemplated for the, the kennel portion um, of this application actually is further from the property line than we would have allowed it if they wanted to go out and build a new building today. So again, um, in this case, we found that the alteration of building use to the kennel, um, when you look at it through the lens of this non-conforming setback, does not have a greater adverse impact to the neighborhood. So for those reasons, um, we found that the non-conforming use application does, com uh, does comply um, with the standards of the non-conforming use review criteria. So moving on to the conditional use portion of the review. Um, again, the conditional use permit is specifically for the dog boarding kennel. Uh, it's not for the dog training, it's just for the dog boarding kennel. And so to recap the proposal, uh, the application is for is to use a portion of that existing structure for eight dog kennels. And then uh, they're also the applicants also proposing to construct a new building um, to have another eight dog kennels in it. Uh, each kennel has a small outdoor attached area. So the kennels associated with the existing building takes up about approximately 750 square feet of that existing building, and each kennel has a four by six outdoor area associated with it. 
And then in the proposed building, it's about 600 square feet or so. Those eight dog kennels each come with an eight by five foot outdoor area as well. So there are a number of review criteria that we look at for conditional use permits. I'm not gonna go into detail on all of them. They are detailed in my staff report, again, as exhibit number one in the record, if you wanted to look at them uh, in a whole. Um, but I'm just gonna touch on two main considerations for the conditional use permit, because I think it, it's going to be most helpful based on the comments we've received thus far um, from, from the members of the public. So the first is that the characteristics of the subject property have to be suitable for this dog kennel. And we can consider size, shape, location, topography, uh, natural features when we're looking at whether or not the characteristics of this particular site are suitable for a kennel. Um, this kennel is going to occupy, gosh, maybe 2,000 square feet of area on a five and a quarter acre sized property. So a very small portion of the site would be used for the kennel itself. Um, the kennel is going to use a portion, a portion of an existing building and proposes to add a new building clustered around all of the existing structures on the development rather than building it in the middle of the field or somewhere else to, ex to, to broaden the, the amount of development scattered throughout the site. So it really is clustering all of that development into one area and utilizing existing buildings to serve this, this purpose. The property is served by a rural local roadway, Pelican Court. It's a, it's a privately maintained gravel road. Our engineering division did review this application and determined that in terms of volume to capacity ratio, right of way width, uh, Pelican Court is adequate to serve this site and the development proposed. And then lastly, when we look at environmental features or natural features, there are no mapped environmental features on this property, meaning we don't have any regulated streams or wetlands on site. Uh, the Department of State Lands did review this application and uh, looked at any hydric soils on the property and determined that based on the proposal, there is no issue with the proposed use and any hydric soils on site. So DSL was, was A-OK -okay with this proposal as well. Another consideration when we look at conditional use permits is whether the proposed use is going to alter the character of the surrounding area in a way that would substantially limit or impair the use of surrounding properties for primary uses allowed in the zoning district. So as I mentioned, I think earlier, this particular site is zoned exclusive farm use, but so are all of the other properties in the area. So we're all we're looking at the same uses that are or aren't allowed when we talk about the surrounding area. Um, dog training, again, is a primary use allowed in the EFU zone, and this kennel uh, proposal is meant to support this on-site use and work towards reducing vehicle traffic. Um, I think that this is important. A number of comments we received relate to folks being concerned with the amount of traffic generated, I believe, by the dog training, um, this kennel is intended to help reduce that amount of vehicle traffic. Uh, reason for that would be, it seems as though a lot of the business model from, from the uh, property owners, the business operators, is that dogs come to the site to undergo multi-day dog training programs. And rather than having the owner drive to the property to drop their dog off and drive away, which is two trips up and down Pelican Court, uh, then come back later in the afternoon and pick their dog up at the end of the day, which would be two more dog, you know, two more trips um, going to and from the site. Doing that for three days in a row would be 12 vehicle trips on the road to and from the property each time you have to pick up and drop off your dog. The idea with the kennel would be um, folks would drop their dog off once and pick their dog up once in the span of three days. So in that same example, a three day training. Um, without the kennel there to support this training use, folks might be driving, there, you know, there might be 12 vehicle trips up and down the road, back and forth, just to get your dog through a three-day training session. But with the kennel, if they stayed overnight, you'd only see uh, four trips on the road. So, so the idea is to, of the kennel would be to reduce the amount of traffic 
associated with the training, which is a primary allowed use in the EFU zone. Um, there's no outdoor lighting proposed, so there shouldn't be any impacts to surrounding property owners with um, light pollution or flood lighting spilling onto adjacent properties. The um, visual character or the visual identity of the surrounding area, again, likely not impacted just by the kennel. I think that's for two reasons. Uh, number one is that a portion of the kennel would be in an existing structure. So truly no change in visual identity or characteristics of the area. And um, the second reason is that the other half of the dog kennel would be located in a relatively small building, located in a cluster of existing buildings on site already and farther back from, from the property line, right to the, to the back of the property actually. So again, very unlikely to impact the visual identity of the area, certainly in a way that would substantially limit folks from using their, their property in the way that they're permitted to use theirs. Um, lastly, we did receive some comments um, from public, from the members of the public with concerns for nearby livestock how how the kennel may impact the nearby livestock. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I, I think it's important to consider because having livestock is, uh, is a primary use allowed in the EFU zone. Uh, I'm just not so sure I understand the connection between a kennel and the livestock. Uh, it is also my understanding that there is livestock on the subject property. Um, I believe there's sheep on the property and so, um, or goats perhaps, uh, the owners can correct me here, but um, there is already livestock on the subject property. And so I'm not sure how that livestock would be unimpacted by a kennel and surrounding livestock would be. And so again, I think it's worth noting, but I, I'm not so sure I understand the, the linkage here. Um, public testimony, I will note that um, the record as of right now is not complete. Uh, it's complete as of about 6.45 p.m. so far uh, of yesterday. So I did receive a number of comments from 6.45 p.m. up until the start of today's hearing. And so those have not been added to the record um, just yet, but I will be adding them onto the website as part of the record as exhibits uh, following this hearing. And so uh, stay tuned for a few more, uh, a few more uh, public testimony as well. Um, very generally though, some of the themes in the comments in opposition that we've received so far, I think are worth noting here. Um, the first is about traffic and, and the road. Um, we've got comments of people driving quickly down the road to get to the site, subject property, um, dust or dirt flying up on the road and potholes or just general degradation of the road because of the business on site. Um, I think that there are ways that some of these issues can be mitigated um, through conditions of approval. So for instance, the dust and dirt, I know that recently Clackamas County issued an approval for uh, a land use application, it's reference um, file number Z0036-23, where the county um, imposed a condition of approval that the applicant had to water water their road um, in periods of drought or, or periods where there hasn't been enough rain coming down on the um, to help dampen the dust that, that's being kicked up by cars driving on the road. So I think there's possibilities to impose conditions of approval to help mitigate impacts related to that. Um, potholes, again, the purpose of the kennel application is to reduce the amount of traffic that's being experienced on the road, people coming to, coming to and from the site for their training classes as they work hand in hand. So perhaps that is being mitigated, you know, the road degradation in general is being mitigated by the presence of the dog kennel. Um, I think there's an argument for that, that case as well. Um, Dogs barking at night, so noise concerns was another one. Um, I did receive a video that that has some audio where you can hear dogs barking off site away from the subject property. So I think it's safe to say that there are other dogs in the area. So I'm not sure how how we'd identify that the dogs barking in the nighttime are from this subject property when it's clear there are other dogs in the area that also bark. Um, but I think. I, I think it would be important to understand too, with the dog kennel, are the dogs indoors? You know, there's an indoor portion and an outdoor portion. 
of the kennel, uh, I'd be curious to know if the dogs have access to the outdoor portion of their kennel at nighttime, or if that's something that gets closed off. Um, perhaps that's one way to mitigate any concern for dogs barking in the nighttime is if they're indoors rather than outdoors. Um, just an idea. Uh, sanitation, pollution, waste management. Um, this relates specifically to the pet waste, dog waste. Um, there's concerns with runoff and pollution or um, contamination to the water resources with runoff, with um, the pet waste. And I think it's important to note here, number one, the applicants did provide a waste management plan in their application materials, which I think addressed how they were going to treat um, the dog waste. So they'll pick it up, they'll bag it, they'll put it in a trash bin that it doesn't have holes in the bottom. So it's being contained. Um, we did receive another public comment that provided some links to different um, resources produced by different agencies across the country that also recommend the same management style. So in order to prevent waste, uh, folks should bag their, bag their dog poop and put it in a bin to help prevent any water runoff contamination associated with that. Um, so I think there's a few resources that were sent in as a public testimony that help uh, confirm that the proposed waste management plan that the applicants provided uh, is a is a recognized is recognized as a as a successful or safe way to deal with that type of um, waste. And then again, um, I mentioned this sort of earlier uh, concerns with providing anxiety to nearby livestock um, with with the dogs, um, and I did touch on that earlier, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, other comments we received uh, relating to this project, so comments related to buildings not being built on the property until the 80s, I think I talked enough about this earlier, but there is some evidence certainly from aerial photographs that prove at least that the buildings have been there since August of um, 1976. Uh, other than the tax assessment data, I don't have any other information to prove it was built in the 30s, but that 1976 date does uh, is important because it does prove to us um, with that aerial photo that the buildings were there prior to the establishment of restrictive zoning. And then uh, lastly, I think it's worth noting that some comments really came in related to the dog boarding kennel not being aligned with state statutes. So to this, I would draw your attention to two particular parts of the same Oregon Revised Statute section. Uh, section 215.283 first states that a county may allow dog boarding. Um, this ORA section specifically talks about uses that are or aren't allowed in the EFU zoning district. And I think it's important here to note that the state did not strictly say absolutely not, no dog boarding, period, end of story. There are many uses that are prohibited in the exclusive farm use zone, but the state did say that the county can provide a pathway for dog boarding, provided they meet the, the requirements, which is this conditional use permit we're reviewing. So there is a pathway. Um, second, I think it's important to note that the ORS did um, specifically determine that dog training is allowed. The legislature determined that dog training is compatible with the resource uh, with the resource uses because it's listed as a sub one um, use and so counties must allow the dog training use per that um, statute. So initially, my staff recommendation um, when I issued my staff report was an approval with conditions. Um, I continue to recommend that same thing, even after reading the public testimony that we've received thus far, um, perhaps with additional conditions of approval to help mitigate some of the impacts that we um, are hearing about, such as the dust, you know, watering the ground, for example. Um, but again, I, I still do con continue to recommend uh, approval with conditions for um, both the conditional use permit and the non-conforming use permit as well. So with that, I'm done my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, I got it. <laughs> You're just to clarify, um, is a building permit required for the addition to the existing building? What is the uh, outdoor stalls? Yeah, the, the addition that occurred sometime between 05 and 2010. Yeah, yeah so um, a permit from the building department would have been uh, required. 
likely an agriculturally exempt permit would have been necessary um, rather than a building permit subject to the structural building code um, just based on the use of that that structure but um, neither neither permit type was um, on file for that addition should there be a condition requiring that they do that yes i would recommend that thank you The second building, which is south of the kennel building, was that, there, I understand they're using that for training, is that correct? Yeah, and perhaps the applicant can help um, clarify that. It's my understanding that the uh, the building, the, the main building we're talking about here uh, was also- yeah, The kennel building. <laughs> yeah, the kennel building also intended for dog training, but the site plan does show that there is a building south of that that also is labeled as dog training. Um, so I suspect that they're both intended for dog training, but we can perhaps get some clarification. Based on the neighbor's um, photos, it appears that building also doesn't meet setbacks. And was that building in existence in 76? Uh, let me take a look. Uh, I was looking at your area, but I looked in the wrong spot. I got my <laughs> Yeah, I can take a look. What I did to determine whether these buildings were or weren't was I, I looked at the tax assessor map and the aerial photos and really tried to find, you know, some of these sheds and shops aren't on site anymore. And so I tried to make sure that I was evaluating exactly the right building based on what used to be there and what's there now. So um, I can definitely take a look and get back to you later on. And just so okay. I can give you a more certain answer on that. Exhibit 10 was comments from development review engineering, and I didn't see all of those in these recommended conditions in the staff reports. Uh, the existing driveway to provide a minimum 12 foot gravel access, emergency vehicle turnaround, circulation areas and parking, and approval from the fire district specifically. That's right. I, uh, I issued my staff report prior to receiving those comments. And so um, I would recommend that we add those as conditions as well. Okay. Um, condition eight on page seven um, talks about the building materials for the kennel. I assume that is limited to exterior walls and it appears to only apply to certain facades. Um, let me see. It would be, yes, based on the referenced code section, it would apply to um, facades visible from the street or with public entrances. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I should modify that condition. Thank you. And it looks like do you, you're more familiar with the site, but is is the building visible from um, public from the private street? Um, I would say no, based on the existence of the existing structures, vegetation, and just with how far it is from the street. Mm -hmm. But it still would apply to the entrance. To the entrance, that's right. Um. That was the only questions I had at this point. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Mr. Christensen, I understand you're representing the applicant. Yes, and there were there were a lot of comments, Mr. Turner, regarding that. Um, typically, I act as the applicant because the applicants generally don't understand the code as well as I do. And also in dealing with the um, staff, it's much easier for me to respond to staff quickly as most will say that I am very responsive. Um, so I was called um, by the Huffmans to represent them uh, in a conditional use and a non-conforming use scenario on their property. And I went out to evaluate the site. The site uh, is 5.26 acres. Um, 
Pelican is off of Mark Road, which is a public road. Pelican, uh, one of the one of the um, exhibits that Melissa will be putting into the record is I actually found out just yesterday about the number of um, potholes in, that everybody discusses in the record, um, how they're created why they aren't being maintained by the county, um, how they have been tried to repair them. And it's a it's a it's an easy process to fix potholes. Now the county says that they are not responsible for Pelican Road because it was not built to county standards. And my response back to county was why would you allow the subdivision to record if the road was not built to county standards? So we're still in that argument, and I'm advocating for the county to start maintaining Pelican Court. What happens is, um, you know, one of the things, my dog goes to training at Huffman Canine. It started back in October. Um, he's done over 10, 13 sessions there. I noted um Jensen Huffman had a pile of gravel and he filled up potholes on his driveway with that gravel. And I asked him how that worked. And he said, they're back. And I said, it's because potholes, um, and that's the biggest complaint is potholes. And potholes were there when the Jensen's moved in. Okay. Um, in the record, Elena Lawson, Jensen's wife, states that they almost didn't buy because of the buy the lot because of the potholes that were in the road. So potholes, it's kind of like a bowl. If you fill a bowl with Cheerios, put milk in it, and you step in it, everything's going to come out. Okay. That's the same with a pothole. If you put just gravel back into it, it is a hardened bowl of soil. And so what you have to do is rip that pothole out and recompact the entire area at least two feet around it to fix it. And that, that has not been done on Pelican Court, apparently. Um, Melissa went through the reasons for having the kennel. The kennel, um, one of the things she, she stated that I, I want to... Uh, amend, so to speak, is the kennels are going to be used for high-end dog training for police and other um, training uses. The training class is six weeks long. So over a six-week period, there will be four trips to the property. Otherwise, they have to come back every day to pick up their dogs and that's just a lot of lot of traffic on on the lot more traffic on the road so the kennels are very important to reduce the amount of traffic on on the road and it is an allowed use it is a public road privately maintained and county transportation said that um it's allowable use and they meet the the traffic criteria um, so there were questions and I just had a quick question you said was sitting the six weeks of before trips to the kennel I, I assume the come the owners coming and picking up the dog at some point in that or doing something during that like six week period so they're coming twice oh wait a minute they're coming they're leaving never mind never mind I forget yes, yes. <laughs> sorry yep thank you never mind um I have had um, hundreds of projects throughout my career. I've never had 32 exhibits in a, in a land use. Um, a lot of the exhibits pertain to the potholes, the traffic on Pelican Court, the dog waste um, impacting other properties and the groundwater. There is no specific 
science behind what they're saying. There are no testing that they have performed in order to make that statement. Um, the next door neighbor who I, I think they put in six exhibits or so um, has a filbert orchard, hazelnut orchard. He has in there a, a um, two second video showing the back of uh, the machine shop is what they call it. But it also shows his property that has absolutely no vegetation on it other than hazelnut trees. How does that happen? I researched it with the state and OHSU, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Oregon State University, yeah, the OHSU, um, said that they use Paraquat and Glyso, Glyso A to kill all the vegetation. That is um, Roundup. Paraquat is 28 times more poisonous than glyphosate. I was told that they spray often underneath their hazelnut trees. They do not tell the neighbors that they are spraying poison on the ground. I would ask them that they would uh, be good neighbors and that that's a separate issue. I understand which, where you're going, but it, it's not something. Okay. One doesn't uh, um, counter the other one. It, it's so a, here's here's the other thing: is everybody said this is a dog training facilities, dog kennels are not a agricultural use, should not be allowed in the EFU, uh, and they cite ORS two fifteen point two zero three. Section two of that ORS says, as used in this section, farm use means the current employment of land for the primary purpose of obtaining a profit in money by raising, harvesting, and selling crops or feeding, breeding, management, and sale of, or the produce of livestock, poultry, and fur bearing animals doesn't say what kind of fur-bearing animals. It's all fur-bearing fur animals. They um, continue to say that um, dog kennels and, and uh, dog training is not an agricultural use. But in fact, um, the primary focus of a dog kennel is care of breeding for dogs and traditional crop or livestock farming. It's alignment with agricultural activities. And I'm reading from our narrative. Kennel, kennels typically require open land for exercise areas, training grounds, and sometimes for the dogs to roam freely. They're not allowed to roam freely on the Huffman site. Um, Dogs are required for traditional agricultural practices, which often require open space for grazing and other activities. Dogs are sometimes used in agricultural activities such as herding livestock, guarding crops, hunting pests. Uh, kennels are absolutely, and dog training is an ag agricultural use. There is um, no question about that. So and yesterday was put into the record a couple of dogs barking off site. There were dogs on site, no dogs barking. Um, we did an acoustic analysis, which was required by the code. The acoustic analysis came back and said that by the time the dog noise reaches the closest joining building, it's at a level that is allowable under county criteria. Um, I also put in a sound study that I believe was in the record yesterday. It is. Um, I saw it this morning. And it states that at the dog park, people were louder than the dogs. It states that the traffic driving by the dog park was louder than the dogs. Um, having been there a lot, 
I'm talking about being at Huffman Canine on site. I I hear no dogs. They're not allowed to they're not allowed to talk. And Elena Lawson, um, when I reviewed the the dog kennels, um, they have barking collars right there in the dog kennel. She said that I heard a dog barking at 1030 at night. I made Jensen get out of bed and go put a dog barking collar on the dog. And these are high end. I, I have one for my dog. They are high end dog barking collars. Dogs allowed to bark once, but if they bark twice, um, they're told by the barking collar not to do that. <laughs> um, they additionally, they have eight kennels right now. They just bought eight more dog barking collars. So they have a total of 12 dog barking collars on site. Um, Mr. Murray also mentioned, you know, the dog waste and how to deal with the dog waste. Melissa said that our waste management plan is right in line with the um, EPA's dog management waste program. They have four dog waste stations. They are in our narrative on site. Um, Those are goats, but that's a dog waste station, just like um, any at a dog park. Okay. They're as good as any at any dog park. They take their dog waste. They have four 50 gallon waste containers and two of them are for dog waste. They don't use two of them um, for dog waste every week, but they do take their dog waste when it's in the um, when it's in the waste receptacle. There's a bag that contains all the bags in the waste receptacle. They pull that bag out, they tie it up, they throw it in the garbage. That's the way they handle the waste. They have two technicians come by every day to walk the grounds to pick up any illicit dog waste. Um, they clean out the kennels. Uh, Melissa mentioned, are the dogs contained in the kennels uh, at, at night? The dogs are. There's a trap, there's a door that slides shut. Uh, the dogs are pulled into the kennel house and they shut, shut the door so the dogs not get back out into the outdoor area um, until the next morning. Um, Elena Lawson told me that she is also going to, she has a bid to put insulation in and around the dog kennel. That'll increase the noise uh, reduction uh, within the kennel. Um, Excuse me. Is the applicant okay with a condition requiring that as they're planning to do it? Yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, yeah, this is Jensen Huffman, and I'll speak uh, on that as the question was directed towards me. Yeah, we have absolutely no problem with the insulation of the kennels uh, to right. reduce dog noise as well as increase the comfort for the dogs. Thank you. And how do you, you said you they clean the kennels daily. How does that What's that involved? Because picking up waste in the field, um, is there any, are you washing or are you just picking it up? Uh, again, this is Jensen Huffman. I'll speak to that. So as Ed had, uh, had, had said, we have two technicians. We have a technician mm -hmm. in the morning that comes out for two hours. We have a technician that comes out in the evening for two hours and uh, a technician that actually comes on site for eight hours during the um, day on Monday. Um, their, one of their primary job responsibilities is to pick up any sort of, like Ed said, illicit waste around the property. Um, you know, we personally have four dogs uh, that are our pets and are, that are our companions. 
And um, they go out, they pick up this dog waste uh, using individual uh, dog waste baggies uh, that we've all seen at parks and whatnot. Uh, those are disposed of in the garbage cans that Ed was talking about. Um, and those garbage cans are lined with a 50 gallon uh, black industrial garbage bag. Uh, like Ed said, the garbage bag is then picked up and deposited into the trash can. Um, we have a plan where weekly on Monday, uh, we use um, a product called Wishy Wash, which is a product that kills any sort of uh, viruses such as Parvo, Distemper, um, uh, the different types of uh, ailments that can affect dogs, especially at places like dog parks where dogs frequent. So that's one of the things that we do to mitigate any sort of uh, danger to anyone's dogs who comes onto the property. Um, I assume you use that inside the kennels? I, what's that? You use that inside the kennels? We do. We do. Yeah. Uh, in, inside the kennels, we use a combination. It's actually a veterinary um, uh, soap solution, I guess, uh, that, that is sold to vet for veterinary use um, to clean the inside of the kennels, the outside of the kennels. Uh, we use uh, the Wishy Wash. Um, it's also important to note that the outdoor kennels are covered, uh, which prevents rainwater from actually getting into the kennels and creating that runoff um, that people were concerned about. Um, you know, and, and really, I mean, these kennels are currently used for our existing dogs. Uh, and so we've had a lot of experience with that. Um, so did that answer all your questions? The, the only other question with you, the, when you're washing the kennel with the soap solution or the wishy wash, where does that go? How, how are you collecting that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a sink, uh, which is attached to the sewer. Um, it's a mop solution, if that makes sense. Uh, okay. so it's, it's mopped and, and, um, and then mopped up and rinsed out and then it goes, you're down. not hosing it down. You're mopping. correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you, sir. Okay. And Mr. Turner, um, all these kennels also have partitions between the kennels. So the dogs don't see each other it keeps the barking down. Um, Thanks. including out to the outside. They can't see outside the kennel. Uh, Jensen, could you talk about the machine shop and the uh, apartments and how you use those for training? Sure. Um, and actually, I think it was Melissa that had asked a question earlier. So let me go back to your question, Melissa, uh, where you asked if the dogs were able to go outside at night and, um, and, and kind of what that looks like. So we have what are called guillotine doors. Now, it sounds much worse than they actually <laughs> are. Um, but each night at eight o'clock PM, uh, the dogs are brought inside. Um, they always have access to the inside and outside during the daytime, but they're brought inside and the guillotine doors come down, preventing their exit into the outdoor portion of the kennels, uh, deliberately to minimize any sort of outdoor noise or, or anything like that. And then at 8.30 AM, uh, when our kennel tech arrives, um, they're all taken out for walks and, and for training purposes and that kind of thing, but that's when those doors are opened. Um, we actually use two different types of uh, barking mitigation. Uh, one are the bark collars. The bark collars have a vibration function um, that when the dog does bark, it gives them sort of this vibration stimulation, which they don't like, and so they stop barking. We also use a non-attrusive... Um, uh, ultrasonic uh, sound uh, device um, that's uh, deemed very uh, um, uh, humanitarian uh, or uh, humane, I guess, uh, used in the kennel. So when they bark, this this uh, device kind of kicks on and it and it sends out kind of a a sound that they don't like, and so they stop barking. It works really really well. So we have very very little barking on the site. Um, we do have uh, the two buildings that are uh, listed for dog training. Uh, 
Um, there's two uses for those. We use those areas for storage of dog training. Um, and then we also use the area for uh, training of very, very high level dogs. So the apartment that had come up is actually an apartment that was existing when we first arrived. Um, I think it's a stretch to call it an apartment. It was used uh, previously when our the original owners that we purchased the property from had uh, a uh, what are called uh, Chinese lanterns um, here on the property. That was their primary farming flower? use. What is that? Oh, okay. The, the it, flower. Yeah, it is kind of a flower. It's then dried yeah. and then it has this yep. uh, lantern that's used in fall, that. decorative, decorative type stuff. Yeah. Um, but they had the workers who were staying here living in this, quote, apartment. Um, I, I wouldn't allow anyone to live in this apartment, but uh, it has created a really wonderful place for us to train both detection dogs as well as apprehension dogs indoors when we're working with local law enforcement. Um, I think uh, there were three letters uh, put into the exhibits um, from Canby Police Department, from Washington County Police Department, as well as Hillsboro Police Department, three of many police departments that we work with. And they come here and we use those areas for detection work, uh, as well as um, uh, other types of dog training uses. So uh, does that answer that question? Yeah, my, uh, yes, my primary concern was, uh, a question was whether the Southern building, which wasn't, staff didn't talk about whether that, it appears to not meet setbacks as well. So was it created before 76? And um, I understand uh, Ms. Lord's gonna look into that as far as the photo. Um, had another question. Oh, your ultrasonic thing that you talked about for barking. I assume that's something that's in the kennel. It hears a bark and, and goes off. So it's not specific to a certain dog. It just goes off if any dog barks. Okay, that's what I assume. Just wanted to make sure my assumption was correct. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Anything else, Mr. Christensen? Um, in regards to the conditions of approval for um, the driveway, uh, the fire department has approved the clearance for the driveway. Um, Huffman Canine raised all the trees that were overhanging on the driveway up to 13 and a half feet. Um, we did put in our site plan that the driveway does need to be widened uh, approximately two and a half feet in some areas. And the uh, emergency pullout at 400 feet needs to be rebuilt. The access onto Pelican Court is more than adequate. It requires a 20 foot radius. The radiuses are much bigger than that. So the accesses onto Pelican Court are adequate. We show that there is a fire department turnaround on site. We have adequate parking. Um, there's more than adequate parking actually. And um, Oh, what else? I, I think that was it. We don't have any improvements required of us for Pelican Court itself. I wouldn't mind um, giving the Huffmans a, uh, a video of how to repair a pothole. Very important that you rip the entire pothole out. You can't leave any portion of it um, behind you have to scarify down to uh, a level below the pothole and then re replace the gravel and recompact it that repairs potholes um what else um the Huffmans have only been asked three times to help repair Pelican Court. They have participated monetarily in doing that each time. And I think that's significant that um, not everybody on Pelican Court monetarily helps to repair Pelican Court. But we just, they need to learn how to repair it properly. 
I don't think that there's anything else. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Mr. Turner, I can chime yeah. back in if I if you if I may um, about that building to the south that's identified for dog training. Um, I just re-verified, but I did actually make reference to it in my staff report. So uh, former me was already thinking about this on page nine, um, but it looks like based on the aerial photos and the tax assessment records, it appears as though that building was from 1953 and has continued to be there ever since as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, now it's time for public testimony. Um, Ms. Olier, I think you were the, had your hand raised, so we'll start with you. You had your hand raised to start, so uh, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah. There we go. Uh, I have some concerns. Your name and address. Oh, Kathleen Olier, O-Y-L-E-A-R. Thank you. 27547 South Pelican Court. Canby, Oregon, 97013. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I guess, Melissa, we're on first name basis. I heard the Huffmans use your first name. So first of all, um, you can tell where a dog's bark is coming from. I've lived here since 1975. And I can certainly tell when the dogs are barking and I have heard them barking. So that's number one. Um, and that's one of my concerns because that's not in keeping with uh, the quality of life or agricultural um, living in this area. This, these kennels that they've put in, the dogs that they training whatever has had an impact on our area there are many more cars coming and going they do not adhere to the speed limit and there is the problem of dust and potholes and mr christensen i would like to address your uh saying we know how to maintain the road and it has been dug down underneath the potholes and the gravel replaced. But people are frustrated because there's so many people, so much traffic, unnecessary traffic coming on our road, and they speed. And then that, of course, sends the gravel to the side of the road. So people get frustrated, and that's why it's not done more often. We do know how to get rid of potholes. We've done it before. Um, I would like to ask the Huffmans, do any of these people, now they have the people coming and going to pick up the dog poop. They have somebody coming to clean the kennels. They have, uh, during their training, these officers, do these officers not come out and work with the dogs as well during that six week period? And uh, the owners as well, do they not come out and work with their dogs with you to help them learn how to uh, train their animals? That was a question I had for you guys. Okay, I'll have them after the public testimony. Pardon? I'll, let, I'll have them respond to all these questions when after the public okay. chance to okay. testify. Okay. Um, I didn't see that uh, structure, the newer one, in 1975 when I moved in. But, Melissa, you're uh, saying Olier, it was there. I, I want to make sure I know which one we're talking about. There's the, the one that has the kennels attached that's the northern structure, and then there's the one secondary. It's the the se secondary. The secondary. Okay. Yes. Uh, and this isn't... It, I'm sorry. What, you didn't see it when? It, when you moved? In 1975. Where? Thank you. But I could be mistaken if you know if it was shown to be on aerial. I think it was shown in seventy six, which is the the in August of seventy six. But the uh, zoning applied in uh, September of seventy six. So if it existed yeah. in in August of seventy six, it is legally established. Okay. Um, 
and uh, the dog kennels are there now and running. This isn't a new thing. They've been there for quite a while now, as as is the noise, the the road conditions, and the potholes have got worse. Um, I'm wondering, I don't understand with it being an ag agricultural use only and uh, the fact that we do maintain our, our road, we have to maintain our road. Why these things were not considered before they bought in this area. Well, the agricultural use state law does allow this use. Um, the training yeah. permitted use. That was the state's the legislature's decision, not something I can reconsider. Um, yeah. So um, the, the panels themselves are a conditional use. Yeah, it sounds like they're really trying to be responsible as far as uh, taking care of things, but there is much more traffic down the road. And um, there is barking. And I'm glad they've got the collars and the whatever they have, but there is barking. And I, as I said, I've been here since 1975. And I can, I mean, I can hear where barking comes from. And Melissa, if you lived a couple doors down from somebody and their dog was barking, you'd know where it came from. Believe me, you would know. So that's, uh, I guess that's my concerns uh, because there is a lot of extra traffic because of this business. The issue before the, the traffic from the training is a permitted use. So it's not something I can consider in this proceeding. The traffic from the, the kennels is, according to the applicant, this is going to reduce traffic from the camp, uh, overall traffic, because the, the dog owners won't have to come back and forth as often. So, I don't but, agree. I don't agree yeah. because doing the kennels, doing the kennels, and they're training uh, police dogs and all mm -hmm. those things, which is wonderful. But I'm sure those officers come out and train with their animals. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll during that time. I'll respond to that. But according to their testimony, they don't. Um, so, but they can expand on that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. O'Leary. All right. Thank you. If you'll go ahead and remute yourself too, so we don't get background noise, I'd appreciate it. Does okay. anybody else want to say anything about this application? Please raise your hand uh, by clicking on the raise your hand button. And uh, I'm pausing to let anybody find the raise your hand button, but I'm not seeing any raised hands. Okay. Ms. Lord, anything further from county? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I think the aerial photos are entered into the record and I'll add my PowerPoint into the record as an exhibit as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Christensen, anything you want to add or Mr. Jensen? Um, I want to I want to say oh, Hoffman, excuse me. <laughs> looking at county uh, road standards, Clackamas County Road Standards updated June 1st, 2020. Section 250.1.2, design speed, A. The design speed for all roads shall be determined by engineering, B. The minimum design speed for all public roads shall be 25 miles per hour. That includes Pelican Court. Someone has, someone has put up a 20 mile hour sign on Pelican Court, which is fine. I personally drive 15 miles an hour when I'm coming and going to the Huffman's. Um, there was one comment uh, regarding their goats getting onto adjoining property. Their goats are adorable. Um, when we were surveying their property, the goats would just follow me around. <laughs> so yeah. cute. The goats getting on the neighbor's property is totally unrelated. So um, it's not yeah. something I can uh, consider. Agricultural. Um, yeah. They are putting up a fence along the northern boundary line. Um, there are some holes in the northern boundary line that allow um, visibility towards the adjoining house. And the Huffman said that they will add vegetation in order to 
counter that. Um, other than that, uh, Jensen, do you would you speak to the six week training? Hi there. Uh, yeah, again, this is Jensen Huffman. Um, uh, Kathleen, I absolutely appreciate uh, your concerns. Um, while I was listening to uh, testimony, I had jumped on Google Earth. And while on Google Earth, I wanted to actually look at the distance and, and sort of the topography um, uh, in, of our kennels versus uh, Kathleen's home. And it's interesting because what I'm seeing is probably a misunderstanding um, between, uh, so if, if we were to go as the crow flies uh, from the kennels to Kathleen's home, the distance is 1,354 feet, which is 0.3 miles. And according to uh, Google anyway, or, or Google Maps, a seven minute walk. Um, between our two properties directly north, uh, approximately 889 feet. Um, Kathleen has a neighbor that has four dogs. Uh, and actually those are the four dogs that we had quickly taken a audio video of um, that were actively barking um, while our dogs were actually very quiet. Um, between Kathleen's uh, home and uh, our property, our five acre property is actually another five acre property, um, which has uh, a small rat terrier that is actually barking quite consistently. Um, they share our property line. And so I can only imagine that there is, you know, just like what Kathleen says, I mean, you can obviously hear uh, the direction from which dogs are barking, but between the kennels that we maintain uh, in a very professional way, uh, where we're really caring about noise and, and noise pollution for our neighbors, um, there's somewhere between four and six uh, dogs that are actively just being pets, um, using their vocal cords to speak out against coyotes and, and everything else. Um, so I, I did want to address that. Um, in terms of potholes, uh, like Ed said, when we first arrived, uh, and this was six, seven years ago, one of the reasons why we actually considered purchasing another property was because of the significance of the potholes that we identified in approximately April, uh, February, March, and April when we were looking at the property and how deep and how <laughs> extensive the potholes were just between Mark Road and our driveway. Um, every year, uh, the potholes come back uh, as per Ed's uh, testimony. Um, the potholes are always in the same space. Um, the uh, folks here on Pelican Court do, I think, a very good job at attempting to maintain the road, but um, we are not uh, civil engineers by any means. Um, I don't know if we actually do know how to maintain it, uh, like what a county uh, road maintaining a crew knows how to do. Um, I know that we've attempted uh, in that space of time, like Ed said, we've contributed um, upwards of over $1,000 to replacing gravel. Uh, we contributed to some sort of oil material that was put down um, in order to help maintain the road. But all it takes is a good rain. And of course, we're in Oregon and rain exists here. Um, the rain fills up those potholes or rain fills it up, just like what Ed said, the Cheerios come out. And, um, you know, we all make a practice of driving in a slalom course through the potholes. And that's been since we've been here from before we brought the dog training group in. Um, and so while I'm absolutely 100% willing to continue, uh, to invest in our road, uh, to put, um, money towards our road and energy towards our road, what I am not is a road maintaining professional. Um, I'm not that guy. I, I, I can train your dog. I can, I can do that, but I don't know how to fill in a pothole outside of a wheelbarrow, dump some gravel in, pack it down with a, uh, with a, with a flat plate thing and, 
and uh, and do my best uh, to kind of help out. Um, I did want to answer some questions in regards to uh, Kathleen's concerns around the police dogs and boarding and, and stuff like that. I think it's important to note that the kennels are here and, and, and our goal is to decrease, not eliminate, but decrease the amount of traffic that is being created through our clients. Now, currently, our business model, um, as Melissa had, had alluded to, um, consists of clients who purchase, say, a five-pack of one-hour training sessions. Typically, once every two weeks, those clients will bring their dogs out. Uh, they're here for one hour, which means that they drive down Pelican Court, they're here for an hour, they turn around, and then they take their dog home with them. The purpose of the kennels is so that they can come here less. It's not eliminating it. It's coming down the road less. So if a client books a, say, three-week board and train, they would bring their dog to our facility. They would drop their dog off, and then they would leave. That's two passes down and back up Pelican Court. In some cases, I'm not saying it's exclusive that they will never come back during that three week process, but in most cases, they won't come back until the end of the three week board and train. When they do come back, they're going to drive down Pelican Court. They are going to have a lesson with their dog so that they understand what we've done and how we've helped their dog. And then they're going to put their dog in the car and they're going to drive away. Now, we're not eliminating the business model of having clients come here on a biweekly basis, but through our board and train, we are minimizing the amount of clients that are coming down the road by extending the period from which they drop their dog off and pick them up. So I think that that's an important uh, distinction so that everybody kind of understands what this business model is all about. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered everybody's question. Uh, those were the questions that I, I heard and the concerns, so I wanted to address those. If I missed something, let me know. Not that I can think of. Um, the applicant has the right to have me hold the record open for an additional week to submit a final written argument. Do you want to take advantage of that or do you want to waive it? I think we'll waive it. Okay. Then in that case, I will close the hearing, close the record. I'm going to take this under advisement because I understand there's several more exhibits that I haven't seen yet, and I want to review those before I rule on this application. But I will, let me grab my calendar. I'm going to try and issue my decision within about two weeks, which is July 11th. I will send my decision to the county. The county will send it to the parties of record. So. Anybody who's testified will be sure and receive a copy of my decision, either orally or in writing. If you um, want to get a copy but you have not testified, you can contact uh, Ms. Lord and she'll put you on the list. Be sure and receive a copy. But that concludes our hearing. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon.